بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله يا ربنا زدنا علما وتقوى واغفر لنا ذنوبنا ونصلي ونسلم على النبي أما بعد When we look at the companions in their lives رضي الله عنهم أجمعين We see a people that were going through a process of transformation and one of the things that we note especially if we start doing a more deeper understanding type study of the lives of the companions and even of the tabin is a systematization not necessarily in a factory type of way but they had a certain type of discipline when it came to their own personal development that's one issue so you see that the companions they always had their portion of interaction with knowledge and with the community even though they were engaging in other things in their lives and then sometimes in the lives of the tabin you'll see more clearly uh, the whole idea of a person apportioning a certain time to this particular area and another portion of time to another area and another portion of time to another area and a lot of times it had to do with personal development and taking care of the rights and responsibilities that were upon that person. In this age of information collection, where we've been bombarded, I, I saw an interesting meme one day uh, of, of late, where it said that before we used to say that the problem that people had was information, and then the information came, you know, and that was the reason why people were In half a so mile, called turn left. Uh, not intelligent. That kind of the meme had a stronger language, but so then they say, okay, well now people have access to information. So what's the issue? And there's something funny to be said about that. Like from the angle that, you know, we're overwhelmed with information and knowledge, but what does it do for us? You know, so when we look at the lives of the companions, the approach towards knowledge is not this modernistic type of approach where we're just imbibing information <coughs> mentally and we kind of get these ideas right in our minds and that's the end of it. You know, that's a extremely detrimental approach to knowledge. It's an extremely detrimental approach to knowledge in which, you know, people are, that people are looking at the issue of information in a consumer-like -like type fashion. So the underlying tarvia that they have or the underlying orientation that they have. And I have mentioned this before. Some people may not like it, but I think it's on point. You know, it was Herbert Marcuse, uh, one of the Marxist thinkers, which was saying that capitalism leaves an, it, it, it leaves an effect or an impact on our instincts. It trains our instincts to be in line with the demands of the system. And so that your instincts will move... At 0.1 miles, turn right. Necessarily, you know... Uh, with without your without your input right and so for instance you'll find yourself in a situation in which you know you don't even know why you're doing things and that's because of that underlying edu right. education that you have have gotten from the system itself and so for instance you know when we look at that reality we can talk about quran and sunnah all day long we could talk about dhikr all day long but in a here here the new school right. new school intellectuals like like uh eric uh, uh herbert marcuse and others and even eric from they had an idea that was on point that you know religion and knowledge and spirituality has been submitted to consumerism and then, right and that and so we in a lot of ways we're taking in lectures we're taking in religious information we're taking in our religious experiences not too much different than the way we take in the hamburger or cheeseburger or french fries or anything else it's just a consuming affair for the sake of an experience well that's not how it is that that the knowledge of the companions transformed them right and so that's one of the one of the issues of graduality which is important to understand is that the companions if you use the example that they learned you know 10 ayat of the Quran, the Quran being the primary source of knowledge that they dealt with and the Sunnah being the guidance. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was living. 
And so the Prophet وسلم, he oriented the Sahaba. He prompted them, you know, in how to implement the Quran. They had a living teacher in that regard. You know, many of us don't have that. So the Sahaba, their situations were known. But one of the things that's important to understand that when they took knowledge gradually is that not only did they understand it, but they had the opportunity to implement it in everyday life, in their reality that they were living. This is what we're missing. Like, it's one thing to learn book knowledge, and this happens a lot. A lot of us, we love to teach and we, we love to learn. And we're taking in this book knowledge, but we don't know how that plays itself out in everyday life. You know, we haven't figured out how that plays itself out in everyday life. I'll give you an example. If a person is learning fiqh, or they're learning the ahadith that pertain to fiqh in, in the matter of salah. And you learn, for instance, that, in the, uh, that there is salah, uh, salawat that are obligatory, and there is salawat that are, are recommended, or salawat that are encouraged. About to go through a uh, toll here, so just give me one second. And so, in the in that in the midst of that, we find that, for instance, you may learn that salat al duha is important. Swipe processing. And so, in, wait. in that process of learning that salat al duha is important. Thank you. The question now becomes: How are you going to implement that at your job? How are you going to implement that in your daily schedule, especially if in your environment, your work environment, is one in which you're not necessarily comfortable with being able to practice? Because let's be honest, like in some of these environments, you don't want to let, you don't want to let Joe or Bob or, you know, the supervisor know that you're a practicing Muslim to that extent. You may not hide your iman and your faith, but from the angle of that, now you're going to take an office room and you're gonna, you know, kick off the whole concept of, you know, Salat al-Duha on your 10 minute, 15 minute break, whatever it is that you have. A lot of us are not in that level. You know, what we're willing to sacrifice like that or where, 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 where we can sacrifice like that. We have real challenges. And so then the issue becomes, how do you implement? Okay, say for instance, in the Shafi Medheb, it's allowable to make the Sunan while you're walking. That's an opinion that's out there. Okay, you may say, well, I'm going to take this to try to incorporate. And then you hear in the community, well, that's not allowable to borrow from this method and that method. That type of concept of confusion. See, the reason of mentioning these things is to say that we can learn book knowledge all day long. But how that stuff plays itself out in our own personal development on the everyday basis, the truth of the matter that what will bring the reality to the fore is our book of deeds. Where Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala sees us at in that regard, right? You know, there, there's a lot of questions that remain, you know, as far as how it is that we're faring in our practice of the deen. We're not talking about the issue of intention here. Because I don't want to get into the issue of intention. That's between the person and the law. I'm talking about the actual practical implementation of the deen. Knowing how to carry that out in a way where we're good with ourselves and our development. And it's working out, you know. We run into situations when the time changes, we start missing Salah. We run into situations that, you know, the stress of life sometimes makes us forget. We run into situations that for a period of time we're on point, but then we find ourselves only focusing on that and not being able to balance out other things. You know, I personally have gone through stages in my life where yes, I was hitting the message really strongly, you know, going to work, dealing with the family, but to keep that in the balance is no joke. And you start to feel bad Well, I'm not in the message. And it stops you from being able to maneuver with other things. You know, and I'm not saying that the salat in the message is an obstacle. Don't get me wrong. Don't misinterpret. Don't add on to what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that building ourselves up in the practice of Islam as Muslims, when it comes to practical knowledge, it's not easy. The Sahaba, they learn 10 ayat at a time. They understood their contents, their meaning, their implications, their obligations, and so on and so forth. And then they put it to practice. You know, that they learn the Quran or they learn knowledge and how to implement it together. We are learning like we're in a laboratory. We're learning, for instance, in, in a way which is divorced from time and space. We come into the masjid, sometimes we come into the masjid and even the orientation is separate from the daily reality. I'll give you an example. 
there was a young boy that I know recently and he's a hafid of the Quran mashallah and I see him in the masjid with frequency and so the brother was in the masjid and he's in the masjid he has a taqiyya on a kufi and his stove on and in that process of being in the masjid he has his uniform and he leads the salah and then I was at a I was at a halal restaurant and I was eating with my daughter and I look out and I see this two brothers pull up in a BMW smooth brothers and then all of a sudden you know the brother salams me and I'm like who are you <laughs> who are you dude I don't know you you know what I'm saying not from the angle of rejecting the salam but the level of familiarity was like overwhelming so then I realized this is the brother that leads the salah you know no kufi on skinny jeans you know it was a completely different person I'm not knocking the brother because that's the way that people get along but the thing is that you know we have split identities we and we learn how to act in this realm in one way and in this realm we act in another way and so we we switch up like with uniforms in that regard and sometimes that works out for some people that are have integrity within themselves and some of us don't have the integrity the ability to combine between all of those realms it actually creates a psychological deficit for us it creates a situation for us which is actually stressful where there's what the psychologists call cognitive dissonance you know where where our beliefs and our mind is at is one thing and where our actions are at is another thing and we feel the pressure that comes from that the anxiety that comes from that and so i wanted to just focus on that point that the sahaba when they learn they learned small portions of knowledge well and then they acted upon that they gave them the ability to implement that in their lives and sometimes even though we can be people of knowledge and students of knowledge whatever you want to say in that regard we can learn and learn sometimes we have to come back to those basics you know because sometimes in our own spiritual development we fade off and so it becomes important to remember this idea that you know implementing the knowledge is one thing learning it is another thing it is not always easy to combine between the two and that's where a lot of us have issues and no one likes to talk about that because we're now we're talking about the reality of life and deficiency and we're talking about the struggles and a lot of people like to keep this whole issue of education of the dean and practice of the dean in a very idealistic state and that's the problem that occurs when we're learning in the masjid with that idealistic framework or we're learning in some institution and we're separating life from the conversation of how to practice Islam. <clears throat> and so what we find ourselves in is states of deficiency and anxiety. But you know, this, there's a deep lesson from the fact that the Sahaba learned gradually and they learn how to implement that knowledge. You know, when we find ourselves falling short, we have to look at what has changed in our life. Sometimes we got a new job. Sometimes we move to a new, new situation. Sometimes we may have to work more. Sometimes we're under pressure and anxiety. There's life contextual reasons and situations that may push a force, uh, push a, uh, or force a change in our routine. And then once that routine is off, we find our practice off. And that, you know, doesn't allow us to be necessarily dynamic. And so for instance, our practice, in order for it to be dynamic, it has to involve with us, you know, some connection between what we're learning and some connection between what we're doing. You know what I'm saying? In everyday life situations, it's not easy. The, 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 you know, I think that- 0.1 miles, turn left. Let me go through this tool. You know, I think we have to be real with the challenges that we're going through. Select vehicle type. Especially when it comes to the swipe card or insert the practice of the dip. You know, processing. Please wait. Thank you. We have to look at the challenges that we're facing in our practice in our practice of the dean in our family life. We have to look at the uh, reality of the situation the psychological pressures right if we're going to talk about implementing the dean because a lot of times people want they want uh perfection but they don't look at the challenges that are there that people have 
You know, and so when people fall off, whether it's wearing hijab or whether it's in salah or whether it's coming around the Muslim community, a lot of things that happen to us as human beings, you know, there's a lot of judgment that comes from the community without understanding the human side. And usually what's the case is that people haven't learned how to take that knowledge and how to implement it in a way that's practical. I knew some brothers, older brothers, that the way that they built up their spirituality, it had a lot to do with it being centered around the masjid and the way that they dressed. And I remember the older brothers used to say, the more sunnah you implement in your life, you know, the more it's a protection. And basically what he meant was, you know, external appearances of the deen and some basic practices. And although there's some truth to that, that it sets you apart to a certain degree, it can also jack you up when you, your routine is off. Again, you know, we're, we're talking about having to be dynamic. You know, when your routine is off, when you can't be in those environments or those situations, then what happens to your persona, your personality? You know, if your deen is just based or predicated upon a ritualistic schedule, then what happens? You know, and we see that. We see that with the hustle and bustle of life, you know, that it challenges the routine. And so we want to come back to this point. We're going to make you bring some clarity to this. We want to come back to this point that the Sahaba, when they practice the deen, they practice it in such a way that it was gradual with understanding. And they had this, you know, relationship to life. They had a relationship to life. We have to remember that the Sahaba also not only had a relationship to life, they had a whole issue of what? They had the, the whole issue of a structure. We don't have that structure. We're trying to create that structure. A lot of us practice because we want to practice. You know, some of us have different motivations. We may, like one of the brothers was telling me, well, my father, he goes out to the masjid to, to these programs for the socializing. I told him, there's, I mean, that's good socializing. At the end of the day, you know, that's going to have an impact on him spiritually, even as for the social component. But still, you know, is that enough that we're socializing with each other as Muslims or are we looking for something much more deeper? Right. And that, that's something that we have to look at that's essential. Are we looking at something that's much more deeper in our spiritual transaction with Allah wa ta'ala? And I think that we are looking for that transformative experience. It's not easy to gain that. It's not easy to talk about personal change in the in the real sense, in, in the sense of seeing it materialize. It's easy to talk about it in the ideal sense. You know, that we do this, change comes about. But no, habits are strong. Habits are strong. So in closing, we want to leave off with this point that take it easy, one step at a time. Not take it easy from the angle of being negligent, but take it easy from the angle of realize that we have deficiencies as human beings. And there's, you know, if we want change, we have to be consistent with, you know, points of graduality. If we implement in a gradual way things with consistency, then we're able to change at another level. But we have to remember in this society, that requires a lot of energy from us because we're not in a place where there's you, you can just pray anywhere and in, in an easy way. We're not in a place where you're just reminded of Allah wa ta'ala at every instance. You have to work on being reminded of Allah wa ta'ala. You have to work on implementing the salah, you know, just at the basic levels. And so take it easy, you know, but grab a portion of practice which you understand and get good at understanding how to implement that practice in every situation like salah or for instance you know having a program of dhikr or whatever it may be you know but it has to you have to learn how to do that in different scenarios and situations you can't expect that to be the ideal model situation you know most of us will not experience what it means to pray salah five times a day in jama'ah in the masjid on a regular basis. We may experience that on our vacation or here and there, or we may have a schedule that allows us to, that, to do that, but most of us won't experience that. Most of us will be just struggling with the issue of implementing the salah. We may get two salah in, in the masjid. We may find on the weekends we're going regularly, and then we may find that the children disrupt that, or we may find work disrupts that. So I wanna keep emphasizing that point. Portions of knowledge that we understand well that are actually digestible, and, and that we can act upon them. I'm going to make up a word, actable. We can act upon them. And, you know, and that we learn how to act upon that knowledge in various situations. You know, not just one situation that's ideal, but we learn how to work with that in various situations of life. You know, uh, and I think that as long as we start having that type of conversation, then we can talk about, you know, real transformation. But there's no doubt 
that graduality is always the key, you know, to returning back to Allah wa Taala. You know, we, you know, intention goes a long way. Remember, the intention, regardless of the action, is rewarded. So you intend to do good, even if you find yourself struggling. Intend it, right? But when we start talking about the actual implementation of the deen, we have to be realistic with what that means. You know, we may be able to sacrifice and go hard at one point and we'll find ourselves falling back like a rubber band effect into the same situation that we were in that are doing us harm. So the issue of graduality is a Quranic principle. The issue of graduality, the Quran came gradually to us. It didn't come all at one time. The issue of graduality is what the Sahaba practiced, but they practiced graduality with understanding. And that's why even though many of them were not, you know, who fathered the Quran and what they did learn, they were powerful in it because they had an understanding of it and they implemented it and that gave them integrity, right? And so one of the things that goes away with the decrease of Iman, it is integrity. Integrity meaning acting upon what we know. Hopefully what we know, we know it correctly, you know, but with deficiencies of Iman, that's what goes away. Integrity, that's why small acts with integrity are more beloved to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala then you know de deeds that are we're doing deeds and we're trying to aim for high things and we don't have consistency in it you know what I'm saying so that's something that is important and that's what we mean by integrity acting upon it you know acting upon our knowledge with consistency right and so we need to learn how to do that in different situations and that's how we should teach the new Muslims to come into Islam or the wavering Muslim or even ourselves you know Make it easy for yourself to practice the deed. Don't put it on a level that's above your your capacity of where you're at. If you want to fast Mondays and Thursdays, you begin by decreasing your food. You know, it may be difficult for you to take that jump. You know, in Ramadan, it may be easy afterwards. I know brothers who tell me straight up, you know, fasting outside of Ramadan for me is extremely difficult. You know, the same thing with the Salah, you know, keeping up with the Sunan. You know, maybe at first it's just practicing, you know, the, the salat and it's maybe consistency will come from the angle of what? From the angle of praying, sitting down. You may not have any place to pray in your workplace, you know, and may be uncomfortable to in, in a way which is extremely problematic, not just in feeling. So you begin at that level. You begin at where you're at, you know what I'm saying, until you gain strength. But if we keep making Islam something and this is one of the issue of some of the, this was one of the uh, problems of some of the militant groups. They obligate the whole of the deen on you. When the reality of the deen is, yani, al -qadr ma istata't, yani, is according to capacity, according to your ability. You look at hajjis like that. Hajjis according to ability. Look at salah. Salah, yes, is an obligation, but then it becomes, do you have the ability to stand? Do you have the ability to do this? Do you have the ability to do that? You know, so the deen is according to ability. That doesn't mean that we don't have discipline and we do whatever. But there's no doubt that, you know, when you're low in the iman, you know, that whole, all that ideal stuff goes out the door. You're struggling. You know, this is something we don't like to talk about. We're struggling. So how do you get out of the struggle? You get out of the struggle by graduality. You take one step, but it's okay, fine. You're missing five salawat a day. You know, and you, you start. You remember Allah in your mind. Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. You start create the environment for yourself. Don't beat yourself up. You already know that you're you're in a problem situation. If you beat yourself up, that uh, negative mindset will create an environment within you that it will be not so easy to practice because you'll depress yourself. And you got to look at why is it that you're going through the other struggles. Don't make your dean a target for yourself. If you're struggling and depressed in life and other situations, people have hard situations that they're going through. You know, you don't compound that by religious idealism, which makes you feel guilty. Your deen should be a release valve for you. It should be a way for you to exit your stress, not to compound your stress, right? And, and, and that's the issue sometimes why some of us, we remove ourselves from the masjid and so on and so forth because of that point. Because of the issue that, you know, the, the Muslim community stresses the heck out of you. And so, you know, we want to we wanna definitely leave on that note, that take it easy, step at a time. Take it easy is not being lazy. It's being real with where you're at in your station, you know, in your condition. Uh, 
if you are not honest with yourself in these situations, you can psychologically collapse yourself. That's what we're seeing. And so that's why we're seeing suicide amongst the Muslim people don't feel like they can be forgiven. That's why we're seeing people say the heck with it. You know, I'm not going to be a hypocrite, so I'm not going to practice. When I get ready to practice, I'll practice. You know, you see all kinds of situations in which people are not learning how to deal with themselves. And when you make yourself a problem for yourself, that's detrimental. That's detrimental. So the dean, according to ability, step by step, as, as they say, shayin for shayin, you know, step by step. And according to ability at the moment, you know, and so learning should be that we can implement. We know that there's commands and practices in the dean. That's not what we're talking about. But when we're sick, it's just like, for instance, when you're physically sick, you know, when you're trying to come back to health, you can't just sit there and eat a cheeseburger or hamburger or, or a plate of rice or this or that. It takes time before you can even begin to taste the food right. Before you can eat a whole meal, your stomach may reject it. You may not even have the energy. It takes time. And that's how it is when we're in spiritual, the spiritual uh, states that we're in. It takes time to come into a practice of the deen. You know, and so the medicine is graduality, step by step. Assalamu alaikum.